yet, not yet, not yet. Mm -hmm. Good morning. good morning. God is good all the time. and all the time. God is, good. God is good indeed. It's good to be with you this morning as we gather together in the house of God to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. It is our Advent season and we have decorations, so that's very beautiful. I have a, my name is Michael Bingham, by the way. I'm the pastor here at St. Mark Church and I have a couple of announcements I would like to call your attention to. Those of you who were there last night at the Oyster Roast, which was a fundraiser for our day school, I want to thank you. I don't have any numbers in yet on how much money was raised, but I know it was a lot because there were a whole lot of people there. But thank you all so much uh, for coming out and supporting our day school at Vibrant Ministry at St. Mark uh, support. So that was, that was awesome. Also, a couple of inserts I want to call your attention to. Uh, one of them looks like this. Uh, it's about poinsettias, and today is the last day. So if you're going to order a poinsettia, you need to do so today. And I would remind you that the, the youth are... Uh, sponsoring uh, our poinsettias this year and the monies raised will go to ship bicycles uh, to assist people who need them uh, for transportation uh, the goal is to ship 1200 bicycles 200 of them here within the state of South Carolina and another thousand throughout the world uh, to assist persons uh, who need who use a bicycle for their primary means of transportation also uh, note this insert about grandma's kitchen there's some items out there it's a fundraiser for the United Methodist women uh, please take note of that. The Good Neighbors will meet for lunch on Wednesday at noon. So if you're available to come here to Heitman Hall at noon uh, this coming week, we'll have ham and the fixings that go with that. And afterwards, we're going to go out and sing carols to some of our shut-ins. And so that'll be a blessed time. So I hope you'll uh, join us for that. Uh, that should be very good. I have a few things uh, I want to call your attention to as far as upcoming events with Advent Christmas upon us. Uh, first of all, the handbells, and that is next Sunday, the 11th, at 5 p.m. The handbells uh, will play, so the ding will be making noise. Right? And uh, afterwards, the youth are sponsoring a uh, spaghetti dinner fundraiser, so please take note of that in your bulletin. So that's next Sunday at 5 p.m. Also, we have a children's program coming up on the 14th. That's a Wednesday following at 6 p.m., and so our children and youth will be putting on a play, and there'll be, a, I, guess a, I guess, think we have a special guest coming. Take note of that. Uh, and then the cantata is two weeks from today during this service, during our 11 o'clock service. And so we hope you'll be able to join us for that. We won't have a 9 o'clock service that day, and so the cantata will take place at 11. And then this year, uh, Christmas Eve is on the 24th. Uh, and uh, so on... <laughs> On Christmas Eve at 6 p.m., we're having a, ca a candlelight service here in the sanctuary. It lasts about an hour, uh, informal and yet moving service uh, as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. 
Lastly, uh, Mr. Frank Morley has asked me to announce about uh, Harris Teeter is discontinuing uh, their gas program. If you have excess points and you want to know what to do with them, uh, they use those for Redbird Mission. So if you'd like to support that mission program, if you'll see Mr. Frank, Frank, raise your hand. Everybody know where you are and uh, see him, and he would love to have those points uh, from you uh, for that worthy cause. Now let's celebrate life and covenant. Are there birthdays or anniversaries that you'd like to celebrate at this time? All right, Jack Barfield's picture on the sports page. That's a worthy celebration. We celebrate life and covenant. That's a celebration of life. Anyone else? All right, this time let's have the lighting of the uh, Advent candle by the Seal family. <laughs> yeah. Some of you may be worried. I sprung that on them with no warning. Morning. Morning. Today we'll be reading from Luke chapter 1, verses 68 through 70 and 76 through 77. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, as he, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness, excuse me, through the forgiveness of their sins. God chooses the most unlikely messengers, a wild man dressed in animal skins and eating locusts and wild honey, poor shepherds shunned by polite society, keeping silent watch in the fields, or today, a school teacher, a plumber, a waitress, a laborer, a doctor, a lawyer, a child, or even you and me. Jesus comes not just to those of us at St. Mark, but to all the people in all places. He is here active and palpably present. His heart still beats with our hearts. He died and is now alive. And so we light this purple candle symbolizing hope as we worship the hope of the world. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks to you for the birth of your Son, our Savior. And we pray that we may patiently await his return in victory. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn of praise, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. It's number 196 in the hymnal.
please join with me in praying the prayer for illumination found in your hymnal. Lord, open our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with transforming joy what you say to us today. Amen. Please be seated. As Elizabeth uh, comes forward to read the scripture text, understand when she says the word, uh, the time sixth month, that's referring to the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, which I'll talk more about in my sermon. I'll be reading from Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be a married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be to me be fulfilled. Then, then the angel left her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we have heard this your word, help it to be fulfilled in our hearts and help us to await with patience the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So approximately 150 years ago or so, uh, really it began in Germany, but there became a, a move in biblical studies to uh, demythologize the scriptures. And it began as, as we, and when I say we, I'm using that loosely, when, when we became uh, better educated and more scientific in our understanding of the way the world worked, there were biblical scholars who uh, made the decision that we needed to take out of scripture uh, those things that were offensive uh, to the scientific mind. Who understood better how things really worked in the world. And so they began to demythologize scripture. Now, we've known each other now for almost six months. I've been pastor here, and I hope that if you don't know anything else about me, I hope you know that I am an unapologetic, unabashed, unashamed mystic. And when I say that I am a mystic, a part of what I mean when I say that to you is I believe in the miracle working power of Almighty God, that we worship a God who was able to do the miraculous things that he says he is going to do. I've seen him at work in my own life, and glory to God, I've, I've been present when others have experienced the miracle working power of God. I have seen transformed lives, and so I know that we worship a God who is able to do what appears to be impossible. So I throw out with the trash the, uh, the concept of demythologizing scripture. I take scripture with all its mythologies intact. Thank you very much. And we have one of the deepest mysteries, one of the deepest mythologies, if you will, of scripture present with us in this reading today that Elizabeth read for us. When the Virgin Mary is confronted by the Archangel Gabriel. Now we refer to Gabriel as an Archangel because he has a name and he has a certain task that he is assigned. There are two angels named in scripture, Michael and Gabriel. Yeah, I know you could argue Lucifer, but we'll talk about that another time. But eight, Gabriel and Michael are named in Scripture. They are called archangels. Gabriel appears to Mary, and Gabriel reveals God's plan to God's people. So this morning, if you're following along on your insert, and I hope that you are, uh, the top of the insert has a blank there, and it says God reveals his plan to his people. God reveals his plan to his people. Now, what I'd like you to do is, uh, if you don't have your own Bible, I'd like you to get the Pew Bible, if you would, please. And on page 3 of your Pew Bible, that's all the way in the front, in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. I hope you'll follow along with me. 
because we're going to go look at the origin, or if you'll pardon the phrase here, the genesis of this plan that we're seeing revealed today in Luke. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, now chapter 3 of Genesis is the story of the fall of humanity or original sin. Adam and Eve have sinned. And what's happening in the 15th verse is God is telling those participants in original sin what the consequences of their actions are. Adam and Eve decided that the serpent was wise and that they knew better than God what was best for their lives, and they went their own way, and we call that original sin. And so in verse 15, God is speaking specifically to the serpent, or Satan. And God says in verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now this is understand, understood by biblical scholars to be the first example of a messianic prophecy in scripture. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Because this offspring of Eve to whom God is referring is none other than Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. And all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, God is beginning to predict how it is that he will get you and me out of the predicament of sin. How it is that he will redeem us from the depth of sin. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, it plunged all of the human race. In fact, it plunged all of creation into the consequences of sin. And all the way back then, God began to reveal his plan. And it goes on down through the ages to, to, to the uh, Abraham and, and, and Moses and all these other servants of God who get a part of the picture until little Mary, a young girl, a virgin is confronted with the angel Gabriel who has this profound message for her that she is going to become pregnant and that the child within her womb is a product of the Holy Spirit and her body and that she will give birth to a Savior and they will call him Christ the Lord. So understand that this is God's word to you and me. We are adopted in to the people of God. We are adopted children. Uh, those who are Jewish are natural. We're, we who are Gentile, I don't know which one of those you are, but if we're Gentile like me, we're adopted children here. Now, what's interesting here is what's been going on behind the scenes. If you've not read the first chapter of Luke lately, that's your homework assignment, is read it. it it's an amazing story here about what's going on. See, Gabriel had been busy. And six months before he appeared uh, to Mary, he appeared uh, to Zechariah. Now, well, it's a little bit more than six months, but y'all bear with me. So Zechariah had been chosen to be the high priest and to perform the priestly duties uh, in Jerusalem at the temple. Now, if you don't know how they did that, they used random lots. They cast lots to choose who would fulfill the duties. And so Zechariah had been chosen, and the belief was that God himself could, could work within the ordering of, of the randomness of the lots to choose the one person he wanted to serve as high priest that year. And, and we know this to be true because Zechariah went into the Holy of Holies to perform the priestly duties. He would have had a rope tied to his ankle in case he was struck dead in there. They could drag his carcass out. That still happened from time to time, you know. And Zechariah is in there performing his priestly duties, and the angel Gabriel appears to him. And says, you're going to go home and your wife, Elizabeth, is going to become pregnant. And you're going to have a prophet. And you're going to name him John. And in the spirit of Elijah will he prophesy about the coming Messiah for the times at hand. Okay, that's what happens. Now, turn with me, if you would, in your pew Bibles back to page 56. Let's get back to the first chapter of Luke's Gospel and let's look at a couple of verses. The first I want you to look at is verse 18. That's on page 56 in the New Testament, not the first time you come to 56. You've got to go to the New Testament, way in the back. Luke chapter 1, verse 18. Now, Elizabeth didn't read this verse to us. Now, Zechariah is in there doing his thing in the Holy of Holies. And Gabriel tells him what's going to happen. And in verse 18, it says, Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man... And my wife is well along in years. Okay? Now skip down to verse 34. This is within the text that Elizabeth read for us. And look at how Mary responds to the angel Gabriel. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, 
since I am a virgin. Now each of them are confronted by an angel with an amazing message, and each of them ask a question. Okay? Zechariah wants a sign. Mary wants an explanation. If you're following along on your insert, that's the second line there. There's two blanks. Zechariah wants a sign. Mary wants an explanation. Zechariah wants a sign. Mary wants an explanation. Here's how I know that. We know it because of the response of the angel to their question. See, so Zechariah is in there, and the angel says, this amazing thing is going to happen. This miraculous thing is going to happen. This thing that you will find hard to believe is going to happen. And that's a message that I have from God. That's what Gabriel said. And Zechariah said, how can this be? I'm, I'm an old man. My wife's getting long in years. And the angel said, because you doubted, you will not be able to speak until this has been fulfilled. Now, Zechariah comes out from in there. He'd been in there a long time. The people outside were worried about him. And he made these signs to them that something awe-inspiring had happened, but he could not speak. He was struck mute as a punishment for his doubt. But he goes home. He has relations with his wife. She does become pregnant, much to everyone's amazement. And then we pick up the story where Elizabeth reading as she's six months pregnant and, she, and, and, and Mary is visited by the angel. Now Mary asks a, an interestingly similar as far as the wording question. How is, is this going to be since I'm a virgin? No punishment here. No condemnation. No aspersions or casting of doubt upon Mary. The angel simply answers the question. What is going to happen to you is through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Mary is simply seeking an explanation. Zechariah, he wants a sign. Now, too many Christians today are in the mode of Zechariah. We want to know from God that what's about to happen in our lives or in the life of our church or in the lives of those around us, we want to know that it's going to be true before it happens. We test God. We demand from God a sign that we can trust Him. And my friends, that's a very dangerous spiritual condition. Who are we to challenge God in that way? It's one thing to ask God in humility for an explanation. It's different to challenge God to prove He is who He says He is. And my friends, we need to be careful about our attitude and how we approach God and how we challenge God. So far too many of us in our churches today and too many of our people in our pews and too many God-fearing people tend to challenge God when he tells us that he isn't still in the miracle working business. And we challenge God to prove to us that that's true. My friends, avoid that spiritual condition at all costs because we suffer greatly as individuals, as churches, as groups when we challenge God in that way. Just as Zechariah suffered, he was struck uh, mute and unable to speak for all the months until his uh, baby boy was born. Now what's neat, and again, this is your homework assignment. I know it's spoiler alert here, but here's what happens. So Elizabeth uh, is pregnant, and she gives birth. And she gives birth to a baby boy. And they say to her, because, you know, they can't talk to her husband. He's mute. Normally they'd ask the man. And they say to her, well, what name should be given this child? And Elizabeth says, John. Now, and let me unpack something here. John is a great Greek name. But they're a Hebrew people. And so the people around Elizabeth, this isn't in the text. This is the Bingham commentary here. But what happens is they kind of think Elizabeth's being a little silly there because who wants to give a good Greek name to a Hebrew boy? And so they go to Zechariah the father, and they say, Hey, what, what name you want to give this child? And Zechariah motions to them. He indicates to them he needs something to write with. And he writes down, his name is John. And in that moment, his tongue is loosened, and he begins to praise God loudly and, and give glory to God for the miracle that he has witnessed. Which brings me to the last point. If you're following along in your insert this morning, our response is essential for God's plan to bear fruit. So there's two blanks there. Our response is essential for God's plan to bear fruit. Our response is essential for God's plan to bear fruit. 
Now, I know it's kind of interesting that in the same sermon, I sort of castigate us for challenging God and demanding from God a sign, and then turn right around and tell you that our response is essential for God's plan to bear fruit in the world. But let me unpack that and explain where I'm coming from on this and how I know it. I'm standing on the New Testament when I say that. I'm standing on the rock of Scripture, and I know this to be true. Because God chooses to rely on on unreliable people like you and me. This is God's choice. It's how God has chosen to do things. If you got a problem with that, I'll let you take that up with the Lord. But the Lord has chosen to use the most unlikely people like you and me to go out into the world and bear fruit for His kingdom. And our response is essential here. So we have two responses, President. We have Zechariah who doubts and then in the fullness of time gets to the point where he can sing the song of faith, and then we have Mary who from the get-go accepts that what God is saying to her through the angel Gabriel is true, and she simply seeks an explanation for how it's possible. So in the sixth month, Elizabeth and Mary, or Mary become, (laughs) let me back up, Got got my counter up. So Elizabeth is pregnant, and Mary gets this visitation from an angel. And then they come together. And if you go on past where we stopped reading this morning, go down to verses 46 through 48, chapter 1. If you've got your text, you can follow me here. Listen to what Mary says when she and Elizabeth come together, both knowing that they're going to be uh, giving birth to boys. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant, From now on, all generations will call me blessed. And so we do remember Mary, and we do call her blessed, along with Elizabeth and Zechariah and Joseph. By the way, if you're wondering where Joseph is, that's in the first chapter of Matthew. You'll need to read Matthew's gospel to find where where Joseph is acting out here, and what he does, and how it is that he is righteous before the Lord. But our response, my brothers and sisters, is our responsibility. What I'm responsible for here today is to stand before you and to preach the truth of God as he has given it to me to present it to you today. Your response is your responsibility. The world is dying to hear from us. The world needs desperately the message of hope that you and I have to give them. We have the answer for so many of the ills that beset this broken and fallen world. And if we are unwilling to share this good news that we have, well, then they're not going to hear it. Because God is waiting on us to fulfill the great commission that His Son, our Lord and Savior, gave to us before He left us. As He was on the mountaintop, He said, Go therefore into all the world and make disciples. Baptize them and teach them everything I have taught you, and surely I am with you always. That's our job. That's our mission. That's what we've been given, you and I. Now, our response is our responsibility. So Zechariah, we see what happens when we don't respond appropriately. His son John was born, and John fulfilled the task that was given him, and he was an awe-inspiring prophet. And he went out and he preached, and I mean he preached. You ought to read that, and it's amazing. He scared them. He scared the, the, the leaders of the day, and they decapitated him. His head was presented as a gift. But he lived out. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He preached in the spirit of Elijah. He baptized Jesus in spite of the fact that he begged the Lord not to make him do it. John was an awesome character, a figure right out of the Old Testament. Our job is simpler than John's. All we have to do is be faithful, be willing to share the love of Jesus Christ with others. How we respond is essential to this. Are we going to sing the song of faith, or will we remain mute and do nothing? That is a question that is ours today. How are we going to respond to this story that we hear unfolding today? Our response is essential if God's plan is going to bear fruit in this world. Let us pray. 
Gracious and holy God, we give thanks to you for this awesome call that you have given each and every one of us to be faithful stewards of the good news. Help us to be willing to give our lives for this cause. Help us to be willing to submit our will to your will, to do what you are calling us to do, and bless what we do, Lord, that it might reflect your will and your glory in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the Lord's table, and he's prepared this table for you and I today. It is before us. We have here the gifts of bread and wine. We're going to pray in a moment to consecrate these, but you and I are invited to this, the Lord's table, to eat this bread and drink from this cup so that we might share in the cup of salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will tell you now, we, in addition to bread, uh, we have some... What's the word I'm looking for? Gluten-free. Thank you. For a moment, it slipped me. We have some gluten-free product up here. If eating bread is a problem for you, please indicate that to us. We'll make sure you get that. And now we come to our time of prayer uh, with one another. We're going to pause here and pray. And one of the things that we need to be mindful of is our need to pray for forgiveness of sin because uh, we are a sinful people. And we will do that today as we seek the Lord's pardon upon us. Also, I would remind you that we're still living in a, a land that is very divided. Uh, we are divided politically. We are divided racially. We have a lot of visions amongst us. And I am firmly committed to the concept that as Christians, the love of Jesus Christ can flow through us to our brothers and sisters, to our neighbors, to our families, and that, the, that healing, real healing, is possible if we will allow the love of Christ to flow in and through us. There are people out there that you feel estranged from. I know there are. There are in my life. There are people out there that look and feel and sound different from us. And I encourage you in the name of Jesus Christ to reach out across those things that divide us with the love of Jesus to help begin this healing process because it does begin with you and me. So I encourage you to do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks to you for this day. We give thanks to you for the gift of this your church, for the gift of this season of Advent, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who was born into the world to die for us. Lord, as we're gathered here today, we are mindful that we are sinners in need of your forgiving grace. Lord, we are hard-hearted and stiff-necked. We go our own way in the world. We do not do what you call us to do, and we... we uh, we do things, Lord, that you command us not to do. We go our own way and not your way. So forgive us, Lord, we pray. And we are sure and certain that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the cross of Calvary that there is forgiveness of sin. And we seek that now from you for us as individuals and for this church. Help us to fulfill the call that you have given us. Help us to make disciples, to go into the world, to bring light into dark places, to bring hope to the hopeless, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to help the sightless see. We pray, O oh Lord, that in all of this your grace might be sufficient. Protect us, we pray. Be with us. Strengthen us. Empower us. And give us the energy and the, the, the talent, Lord, required to preach your gospel. And we pray all of this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior as he taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, let us offer unto God his tithes and our offerings.
Almighty God, bless these, your tithes and offerings, to do your work in the world, and we pray that they might be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. You can put them here. Put them here. Thank you. If you would turn to page 13 in your hymnal for the great thanksgiving. I'm going to be using a slightly amended version of what you have in your hymnal. The great thanksgiving I have is for the season of Advent. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts, and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things, and the rich you send empty away. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. This is the cup of salvation, and it contains the blood of Christ, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. I would like to ask those uh, that I asked to help with the communion to come forward at this time so we may serve the people of God.
You'll be directed by the ushers when to come forward and we'll begin serving communion. Arise now and go in peace, sure in the knowledge that Jesus Christ died for you, and be thankful. Amen. Rise now and go in peace, sure in the knowledge that Jesus Christ died for you, and be thankful. Amen.
Arise now and go in peace, sure in the knowledge that Jesus Christ died for you, and be grateful. Amen. Arise now and go in peace, sure in the knowledge that Jesus Christ died for you, and be thankful. Amen. Arise now and go in peace, sure in the knowledge that Jesus Christ died for you, and be thankful. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 206 in the hymnal. It is, I want to walk as a child of the light, to stand and sing to the glory of God.
Receive now this benediction. Now go out in peace and serve your God and your neighbor in all that you do. And may the blessing of Almighty God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you now and evermore until we meet again. Amen.